Um, okay. So, uh, hello everyone. I am Agenas. Uh, I am conducting interviews about open science on behalf of SIOS, the Student Initiative for Open Science. And today we will be interviewing Eric Jan Wagenmakers, uh, a professor at the uh, at the methodology unit in the Department of Psychology in University of Amsterdam. And we will talk about open science in general and uh, how you think, how you created a good research practices course at our university. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, your good research practices course was actually one of the inspiring factors that led to the creation of SIOS, but uh, we don't really know much about it. So how did you decide to include the course in the curriculum? Was it hard to get it accepted? How was the process? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So I think the course started out. Uh, sorry, my my uh, kid is at is at home. Uh, he's not feeling well, but he's feeling well enough to uh, shout from the couch, uh, uh, "Who likes me? Who likes me?" So <laughs> anyway, uh, now the um, uh, the course started out under a different name: Good Science, Bad Science. And it was inspired also by a series of uh, uh, of books. And uh, <clears throat> at the start, uh, we would just take people, take students uh, through a research uh, uh, project. Um, so every uh, there were different groups of students, and they all had to do a particular uh, research projects. So it was actually about doing science. Um, but it turned out that this was um, not for everybody. So there was clearly a need for people to, uh, to have a textbook and to have more structure because uh, uh, at the start, it was more like a sort of a really large lab meeting where we would discuss, okay, what direction are we going to take this research in? And some students really got a little anxious, like they were tossed into this pool without learning how to swim. So they felt that they were drowning. And so um, maybe at the start, uh, we were a little bit too ambitious so uh, we, uh, uh, and, and at that point, uh, Chris Chambers uh, wrote this uh, uh, book, The Seven Deadly Sins of Psychology. And so we, uh, we use that as a textbook and it, it fits the course really well. And uh, that, that, that book sort of creates the backbone of the course. And, um, and I think it, uh, it yeah, it, it worked out really well. We have lots of guest, guest lecturers now uh, so it's not boring that you have to, for instance, look at me all the time when I'm sort of every class, I would say something. So that's, that's not the case. There's, there's tons of different people. And I'm actually quite proud at the, um, uh, the kind of people that we, uh, that we get to talk to the students in this class, right? We, the, the final lecture is always given by Chris Chambers, the man himself. And so, um, uh, I personally, I think as a student, I would love it to have sort of the author of the of the textbook uh, give a presentation. Of course, everybody who's in this field is really passionate about it. So that usually makes for uh, interesting lectures and it's, uh, it's also kind of a common sense topic. Uh, and if you don't like to discuss these kinds of topics, then you're really in the wrong research master, right? So, so I think it appeals to everybody, but yeah, but at the start we were a little bit too ambitious. So, uh, uh, we even so it the, at the very first time I think we had even planned to publish the uh, resulting uh, uh, papers that would come out of this uh, this course, but that was just uh, yeah that 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 didn't happen because you you can't do that within the time frame of a single course, and so uh, then you need to work on this topic after the course is done, and yeah then you know life takes over and and. Uh, things st start stalling and it doesn't work so i'm happy i'm happy with the way it is uh, it is now but ideally ideally you would have kind of a an extra course or something a follow-up course where you actually do research yourself and you you uh, uh we discuss the topics we discuss in the course in con in the context of very specific research that you execute yourself i do i do think that's the best way of learning but you know, it, it takes a, a, a lot of preparation and a lot of uh, energy for everybody. Uh, for those who are not from our program, the Good Research Practices course covers uh, certain open science topics such as questionable research practices, uh, the importance of direct and uh, conceptual applications. 
pre-registration and the public sharing of data uh, code and analysis plans. Also, yeah. it is very uh, student-centered and uh, it is uh, students are asked to engage in social media platforms that promote open science and, um, and encourage yeah. students to engage in ongoing discussions all the time with uh, prominent figures yeah. in the open science community. Uh, but are you planning to create this follow-up course that you just mentioned or? Well, you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, I, I actually have multiple courses that I would like to teach, but um, it's kind of the opposite problem. Most of the time, the, you know, the department wants people to teach more <laughs> than they would like. And I think I would like to teach uh, more than I'm allowed to. So, uh, you know, courses cost money. So you can't just say as a teacher, like, I like to teach this course, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so I'm not sure whether it will uh, materialize. I, I do think it would be interesting um, and it would be relatively straightforward to do, but uh, yeah, I need to convince some people. And so far I've been happy with the course the way it is now. So uh, if I had been really unhappy, I would have looked for other you know, ways of doing things, but I'm, I'm pretty happy. So that takes a lot of pressure off and it may, it may happen in five years or, you know, I'm not in, in no rush. That actually it also nice. depends on the students, right? If there's a lot of, if there are many students who say like, we really want to do this, right? And they, uh, they approach the people in charge, then I'm sure that they can easily convince those people, but yeah. Well, maybe after but, we plant this idea, some more students will be interested. Right. Yeah, maybe. And um, it actually re connects really nicely to my second question, which is, uh, do you think that the good research practices course is effective in promoting open science practices and at the very student level? And uh, what were some observable changes that you've seen within the years in line with the course? Yeah, so I think the, uh, and I'm not sure, I, I mean, the, the, um, the course is just a symptom of a changing research environment, right? And that changing research environment affects everything. So I think at the University of Amsterdam, a big change is then when you do your thesis work, um, um, or I think even when you just want to uh, test participants in an experiment, you have to indicate whether it's going to be a confirmatory or an exploratory endeavor. And when it's confirmatory, you're asked to do this, to answer these questions that is basically kind of a pre-registration um, uh, that is uh, based on the uh, website uh, aspredicted.org. Uh, and, and so that, those are a few simple questions, but it nevertheless forces people to um, indicate what they, uh, what they have planned. And I think that's when, when you have to do that, then, then every student will be attended to the fact that this distinction is important. And the, 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 the staff, the teachers will also be, uh, will also uh, get the message. So I think nowadays, you know, it, it took some getting used to, but, but people very quickly adopted this new mindset. I think it also, it's also in line with, um, you know, how most people think science should ideally be done, right? That you say what you expect before you actually see it, especially when you're a researcher who's invested in the outcome. So, um, yeah. Well, actually, SIOS is also an example of how effective it is in a sense. Yeah. Because then yeah. Yeah. some students to create their own initiative to promote it even further above and beyond the course level. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was very pleased to see that. Yeah. And uh, did you follow our progress? And what do you think about it? Uh, do you have any recommendations for us or right. anything that we could focus on? Right. Well, I, I follow you on Twitter, so I, I, I kind of see what you're, uh, what you're doing. And uh, I've also given a presentation at one point in one of your lecture series. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, um, I think uh, it's, uh, I think everything is going well. I, I, there may be some initiatives, initiatives in the future, maybe a Dutch reproducibility network or something where you could uh, form like a local node uh, in this uh, in this whole network, but this is something that is in the process of being set up. So it's not quite there yet. But but once it's there, then I think uh, you can connect to that. And in general, I think there's much more attention uh, right now for open science and replicable science. So 
uh, new initiatives are starting up. And when you connect to those, I think that's really important so that you can, uh, you know, exchange uh, ideas. And it's also just interesting to talk to people from other disciplines and um, yeah, departments. It's actually in our agenda too. We're trying to connect to uh, other schools and other students, uh, as well as other bigger networks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, what do you think that the future holds for open science? Are you optimistic about it? Um, yeah, you know, there's a, in a way, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. So uh, I know that there are some people who are skeptical about uh, open uh, science. I have never understood their arguments. Uh, and I also think uh, that... Uh, that they're just too late to stop the developments. You know, there's just some, some um, ideas that are intrinsically good so that, so that once you switch to the, to the new idea, you're never going to switch back, right? There may be some hesitation at the start. They say, well, you know, what will the future hold? Everybody's uncertain, but then you switch. And then, so, so in, in most societies, for instance, uh, let's say um, uh, the right uh, 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 of women to vote, right? Well, shall we do this? Shall we not do this, right? And then uh, clearly to uh, go back to a situation where that isn't the case is, is unimaginable, right? Completely silly. So, uh, so, so I, I like to think of open science practices this way, where, where uh, it looks like a good idea. Some people have doubts, you switch and you realize, no, this is, obviously a really good idea for people to be transparent. Um, so uh, yeah, there are some conservative people arguing against open science practices. I think they usually attack a caricature of open science because every human endeavor has positive and negative sides to it, right? So uh, it is true that not everybody who promotes open science is a pleasant person, for instance, right? So then, uh, but, but, but it's, it's a mistake to then say, oh, this, this person is misbehaving and therefore open science is uh, bad or something, right? So, um, so I, I think that reflects more an intrinsic mm, distrust towards certain open science practices. And then you use an excuse um, to, uh, to try to discredit it. But, you know, that's a very, that's a, a vocal, minority, but a very small minority. The, the large groups, like the overwhelming majority of researchers is completely on board with transparent uh, science, which I think is a, is a good idea. And, you know, from the perspective, especially of a young researcher, right? You're starting out, you want to contribute something, right? You always enter the field with a really positive mindset. I want to devote my, my life to this work, right? You want it to mean something. Right. You don't want it to be just noise. You don't want to fool people. Uh, you don't want to fool yourself. Right. So I think, especially young people, um, they're very they're very motivated. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you can. Zwei maar even. Zwei maar even. Zwei maar even. Naar die vriendelijke mevrouw daar. Zwei maar even. Ja. Schat, het wordt opgenomen. Dit voor posterity. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, that was my uh, son, Theo. Uh, he's, uh, his, uh, he has a teacher who's tested positive for Corona. So he's in quarantine right now, which is interesting. Uh, this it illustrates a little bit the problem when you have young children at home and you're trying to do work at, uh, during a corona, corona times. So I'm sorry, but uh, it's, it's unavoidable. Yeah, I think it's something that we are all facing, like due to the current circumstances. So, um, so you mentioned that some people are skeptical about the open science practices, but uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges in open science in real life? What do you think uh, some factors that holding people that are holding the current science and researchers back from implementing these practices uh, to a greater extent? Well. Um... Mm -hmm. I think most of it is uh, laziness, probably, um, or unfamiliarity um, with, the, with open science procedures. Like if, if you do something that your advisor tells you, 
then you know your advisor isn't isn't implementing those open science practices, right? Only in certain fields like medicine is where they do pre-registration on a routine basis. But in any other field, this is not happening. So if you don't see it in your immediate surroundings, if your institute doesn't mandate it, if your advisor says, basically, I've always done good research myself and it's never been pre-registered. So uh, why would you pre-register it, right? Then then uh, then it's a, a little difficult, right? But so it needs to become kind of the norm and then it's easy. So uh, if you're the odd one out in your by, just by yourself trying to do this, this is very difficult. So I think that's also why it's, why it's nice that there, that there are organizations that explicitly promote these practices so that if you have the strong feeling that this is the right way to go, then you can connect to those, to those groups and, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, maybe get some support from them. But like, like I said, I think generally it's just a lack of awareness. So if, you, if your advisor is reasonable and has never pre-registered pre anything and you go to your advisor and say, I would like to do this, then in my experience, it happens rarely that the advisor would say, no, this is a bad idea. Right? The advisor may say, why would you go to all this trouble? But okay. If, it's, if this is what you want to do, then, then you should do it. Why not? The same with sharing data, right? And sharing uh, anonymized data, properly anonymized data and materials. Often, if you just want to, if you express the desire to share this, then your advisor is, is usually not going to stand in your way. Actually, your advisor probably doesn't even care, uh, but you do have to take the initiative. Um, in, an, in a research environment, that doesn't mandate these things, right? It doesn't uh, incentivize those activities, but this is changing. So more and more research environments are incentivizing those activities, and then it becomes a natural thing to do. And perhaps so, some, yeah. uh, perhaps the use of free country <clears throat> statistics is also contributing to certain questionable research practices. And when you mentioned familiarity, uh, such as familiarity in Bayesian statistics, uh, yeah, that it would be a solution to some of these questionable research practices and why. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. So, so now, obviously, I'm a, uh, I'm a one hundred percent Bayesian, right? So, any chance I get to uh, punch uh, the frequentist paradigm on the nose, I will take it. But uh, honesty does demand me, does demand that I say uh, um, these other activities to make sure that you plan your experiment properly so that you have a large sample size, um, um, that you uh, do not cherry pick your uh, phenomena, that you pre-register those kinds of things. They, they, they ensure that, that you can evaluate your results in an unbiased way. And, and that's actually more important, I feel, than what specific statistical analysis you do at the end. Right, it, it is statistics ultimately is a little bit of the garbage in, garbage out type. So if there's garbage in, there's no way you can recover from that, right? So it all starts with the quality of the data and the experiment. But if you have a high quality experiment and high quality data, it is kind of, I feel it's kind of a shame. It's a missed opportunity to j then just compute a p-value or even a confidence interval and then be done. There's so many, there's so much more insightful conclusions you can draw when you when you uh, do a Bayesian analysis, maybe in addition to the classical analysis. So um, I really think after spending so much time and effort on getting wonderful data, why not spend a little bit of additional effort to get a wonderful analysis as well? well that's very informative. And you are also the founder of uh, JASP, which is an open source free statistical software that gives an very easy to use interface and allows Bayesian analysis options to its users. But uh, what led you to decide to create JASP? What was the need for it? How did you, do you think that it's yeah. to open science? Yeah, so the, so the, uh, so the origin of JASP was uh, very simple. So it, it does offer both classical frequentist and Bayesian analyses, but the, the purpose at the start was certainly the Bayesian part. And the idea was, you know, I was 
advocating Bayesian analyses. I was pointing out all these fundamental flaws with p-values, but then you, you do need to offer a very concrete alternative, right? And um, most researchers just use a drag and drop program like SPSS to do their statistical analyses. So, um, so they may accept the theoretical arguments, but they would still just, you know, keep doing what they've been doing all along. So I wanted to create kind of a level playing field where it would be just as easy to do a Bayesian analysis as a, as a frequentist analysis. So that just meant creating like Bayesian SPSS. And why we, while doing this, we also figured we might just as well, uh, you know, develop a program that's actually better than SPSS in terms of um, um, uh, usability. And we might just as well add those p-values, right? So uh, that took some convincing. It wasn't my idea originally to include those, but the idea was that JASP would uh, function as a Trojan horse where people would take the use the program because it's free and because it gives you the p-values and the confidence intervals. And then they would see, hey, you can also do a Bayesian analysis. What happens if I press this button, right? And then hopefully it would make it the transition to Bayesian inf inference easier. That was the uh, ultimately the argument that convinced me to also include the classical stuff. But it's uh, quite possible that JASP now is mainly used to teach students uh, classical statistics and, and p-values. So uh, yeah, but the the Bayesian part is the that's the part I really care about. If we if we had just implemented the p-values, well, I wouldn't have done it then. I wouldn't have seen the point. I think it's very easy to use. So maybe most students uh, choose that because it's user friendly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we spent considerable time trying to make it user friendly and trying to make the plots look nice. And uh, we still, uh, we're, we're actually developing it as actively or perhaps even more actively than ever before. So uh, there's a, a number of important uh, uh, updates coming and we're even working with a company who wants to have certain uh, uh, procedures available yeah the kid and i think it also uh it also is very related to open science in a way because it's integrated in the open science framework so mm -hmm. it's actually other than providing basic analysis options it has actually had this strong connection to uh yeah yeah oh definitely definitely and um uh, we are also trying to, we also spent quite some time making it easy for people to annotate their analyses. And we also have a data library in uh, JASP. And um, this is of course pleasant when, as a, as a teacher, when you want to demonstrate an analysis because you can just take an example data file from the data library. But we've also created a book that goes with the data library. And it, uh, it gives, an, exam gives uh, an example for each data set of the way I think data sets ought to be archived. Because that's one problem, practical problem with sharing data is that people just share, you know, people share and for them at the moment that they're sharing it, it seems that everything should be clear. But it's very difficult for people to take the perspective of the consumer of what, what they put out, right? So for the consumer, for instance, if you, have your data in a .sef file, an SPSS file, and they don't have SPSS, it's an immediate problem, right? Or if you call your, you know, the standard example is that you call your variables v1, v2, v3, right? And nobody knows what's going on. Um, so you, what, what we show again and again in this, uh, in this book is, you know, you want to have, uh, obviously the variables need to be clearly defined, but you also want a screenshot of your, your data structure. You want an example analysis, right? So that you can actually take the data, run the analysis, get the results, see the interpretation, right? Because then if you take those steps, you know that it's working. And at, the, uh, at our uh, psychological methods unit, we often um, look at data sets of other people. Sometimes we have to do a, a follow-up analysis and most of the work is actually in getting the data in the right format, not executing the analysis itself. It's, it's uh, trying to figure out what the data actually are. That's the biggest hurdle. So I think um, when it comes to data archiving, I think 
the emphasis right now is on somewhat on the wrong things. Um, that, you know, it needs to be findable and uh, inter, you know, it needs to open on different operating systems, etc. And uh, yes, that's all true, of course, but, but explaining the contents of the file and allowing everybody to open the file, you know, th th those are really key, key issues. Um, also, open science is very prominent in Netherlands and Germany, uh, for example, but it is less so in uh, other <laughs> less developed countries and especially in non-Western countries around the world. And uh, what do you think can be done for that? What would be your suggestion? Yeah, well, so it clearly can be done. Right, it it can be done because they in medicine pre-registration is just the norm. So I think here a very important role. The easiest the easiest thing to do is for funders and journals to demand certain standards. Right, and this is already happening. So uh, this this will mean that these other countries will have to uh, play along. Right, so in the U you you can be a researcher in the U.S., but if you want to publish in particular journals. One sec, I'll ask, I'll ask if my uh, son could be a little bit more quiet because I, I uh, find it difficult. Um, so um, this actually relates to a, a, a study uh, by Bobby Lee uh, Houtkoop, a former uh, research master student who uh, did a survey and she uh, looked at what will make researchers share their data. What are the biggest obstacles they see and what would make them uh, share data? And basically everybody uh, said, we are perfectly willing to share data if the journal wants it or if the funder wants it, right? So it's, and for a funder or a journal, it's as easy as just saying like, you know, we, uh, we expect you to share the data or if you cannot share the data, tell us why. Right. So you have these top guidelines that uh, where, where a journal or a funder can, can pick a particular level of transparency. And the only thing that the journal needs to do is say, with respect to data sharing, we adopt the first level of the top guidelines or the second level of the top guidelines. Right. So the first level, so the very first level, I'm not sure whether they call it level zero or level one, I think level zero is do nothing. Uh, just keep it as is. So that adopting that is just uh, yeah, not changing anything. But the next one is already saying for data sharing, it's already saying, uh, you know, you have to if you don't share your data, that's perfectly fine. But you have to give us a reason, right? And that already puts a lot of pressure on people, because when you do that as a journalist, as a funder, you are basically telling researchers, we value this practice. We like you to share your data. Right. And automatically, uh, researchers will think, hmm, so my chances of getting accepted in this journal or my chances of getting a grant from this funder will go up if I engage in this practice. Right. And so immediately, uh, people will engage in those, in those practices. So that's the easiest thing. Just funders and journals, they have to do you know, very, very little to achieve a huge change. So that's one way. The other way is, of course, where researchers, it's more grassroots, bottom up, where researchers themselves start, start to create their own societies or like seals and then, and then exert pressure uh, on, the, on the journals and the funders to change something. And, you know, perhaps both things could go on at the same time where some grassroots uh, organizations will, will pressure uh, funders and journals to change their policies and then those policies changed and that that means that it becomes the norm and then very quickly um, uh, a, a research environment can change. I, I also think that it is very important to see change at the publishing level because uh, once you mentioned in the course that most of the teachers they might be very ad advocating open science and for themselves it not, might not be important to like uh, publish in an open access journal because they have nothing to lose, they're pretty established. But for their uh, PhD students, if there's a choice between choosing a very prominent journal that is not open access versus choosing yeah. an open access journal, uh, most would yeah. go 
for what is best for the career of these PhD students. Yeah, yeah, but even e those kinds of considerations are still important when you're more established. So, for instance, there was a discussion at the time whether the reproducibility project psychology should be published. I think it ended up in science or nature. I think science, science. Uh, whether it should be published in science or nature because these are paywalled journals, right? They're, it's not open access and it's not, it, it's everything is very uh, commercial. So why not go to Royal Society Open Science, for instance, or PLOS, you know, something that, but on the other hand, you want the paper to have a real impact. And if you publish it in science, it will have a, a major impact. So, um, so it's not as principled as you could be, when you publish it in science, but ultimately it, it, uh, it's, it's for the good of everybody. So I, there was a debate, but ultimately, uh, yeah, science was the, was the choice that people went with. And I think it was a sort of, well, you never know what would have happened, happened had it been published in PLOS, right? I mean, John Ioannidis has this paper, why most published research findings are false and it's published in Frontiers, I believe, um, which I think is, I'm not a fan. I published there myself, but that those days have gone and I'm, I'm not a fan. But uh, look, I think that paper is cited over 10,000 times or something. So it's clearly possible to have uh, well-cited articles in, in these kinds of journals. So you, you, you never know whether it was the right, right decision. Well, there is always- But it, it did have a lot of influence. Uh, at the current system, there seems to be always a trade-off between this open science ideal and the way current pu major publishing houses work. So hopefully that is something to change in the future as well. Yeah, and yeah. I think the, the, the situation, they had this plan S, right? Where they uh, wanted uh, researchers to publish in open access journals. And I believe that it originally plan S was quite radical. It, it prohibited researchers who were on particular grants of publishing in journals like science and, and, and nature, right? So um, they softened it uh, considerably. And why? It, because researchers themselves complained. They wanted to keep publishing in those journals, right? So the researchers themselves argued to, 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 to keep the status quo and to keep these publishing houses making a lot of money at the expense of taxpayers and researchers. So I think, I think that is a, again, a missed opportunity. They should have had a spine and just said, no, we pay you. This is not your money. This is money from the taxpayer. And so you cannot publish in these kinds of journals that hide the knowledge from the world. It's just, you cannot do it, period. And so, um, uh, yeah, so they didn't do that. And I think it is the only way to break the power of the publishers. Anything that everything that has, has been tried so far has not made a dent into the, um, you know, the, 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 the income that the, the publishers generate, right? Yes, you can, you can pay extra for open access. And now publishers make money both from the subscriptions and from researchers paying for open access. You, no, I think it, the only the only way out is just saying like we will, you will you are simply not allowed to do this. There is no reason. There's no, absolutely no reason. Uh, I I don't I don't see the added value. Uh, uh, researchers do all the work. They do the editing. They do the reviewing. They create a, a very well formatted PDF document, so it only needs to be put into the journal style, uh, and 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 that's it. Right, it's gone. Are the, long gone are the days where we actually had to send hard copies all across the world, because you know nowadays you just put a PDF online. So clearly we need to move to a different system, and I think that will uh, be one of the major changes in the next twenty years. So uh, I cannot see the current situation existing for very long because it's just too obviously wrong. Well, hopefully that will change in the future. And my last question for you today is. Uh, what else do you think can be done to promote open, uh, open science even further at the university researcher and student level? 
or at an institutional level? Well, I, I think, honestly, I think at the University of Amsterdam, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, certainly for our research master, I think there it's absolutely clear, you know, there's a, uh, the good research practices course is completely devoted to it. There's also these institutional policies that promote it. Many people here in the department explicitly endorse open science practices. So uh, I think that may not be the case everywhere else. Uh, uh, but for, for, for our department specifically, even, yeah, even in our, our, our bachelor students um, are, 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 you know, taught good uh, research practices uh, in their second year, at least, and I, probably in the first year even. So, no, I, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job. Um, you know, I think if you have a discussion with everybody, maybe some people would even say that we've gone a little overboard here in all our focus on methodology and good research practices, and maybe we should focus more on theory or something, which I, I love theory. I think we have a lot of it in psychology. People are usually very pessimistic, but that's just because they don't read the Journal of Mathematical Psychology. People who say we don't have theory in psychology should be required to uh, read the past five years of articles, worth of articles in the Journal of Mathematical uh, Psychology, I think. And then they, they, let's see whether they say it again. If they say it again, they have to read the, 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 the other five years before that. And I think quickly they will stop saying that. But it's, it's, it's just uh, fashionable to say like, oh, we don't have any theory. You know, look at Psych Review, look at Journal of Mathematical Psychology. It's, uh, there's also journals that, that, you know, publish findings that are not immediately relevant to theory, but we do, we do have it. It's just harder, right? And people are just intrinsically lazy. So if you see something that's difficult, you know, like I, I, I do this myself. I, if I see something that's difficult, if I see an article and it has uh, difficult derivations in it, the, the, what I will try to do, unless it's really important that I actually understand what's going on in, in detail, I try to understand it without, you know, while investing the least amount of effort. So this is just how people, uh, how people are. So, uh, yeah, but I, so I want to end on a positive note. I think the change we've seen over the past decade is absolutely mind blowing. I would have never guessed that it would that it would uh, uh, you know go this far and and be generally accepted. And and there's actually um, we we are kind of putting statisticians to shame, you know, because statisticians have for years they have been um, coming up with all these minor uh, adjustments to models like the ANOVA or like, maybe you should do a such and so correction in such and so analysis. And, and they are completely ignoring the, the big picture here. And I think as psychologists and also methodologists working in psychology, we actually do see the big picture. And we, we realize, hey, garbage in, garbage out. That's the main problem we're facing here. And uh, we're even coming up with uh, uh, statistical innovations. So, um, so the, the field has woken up and has responded and uh, it has the way that it has kind of restored my faith in humanity a little bit the way the way people uh, people were are able to quickly change the, the 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 way they do science and the way their advisors and their advisors before them have done science all their lives so a great time for young people to enter academia i think wow. never a better time than this First of all, thank you for joining us today. And secondly, personally, I want to thank you for introducing me to this world of open science with your course. This is why I am here today, uh, because I was also one of the students inspired by your GRP course. And um, yeah, I would like to thank you for that as well. Well, thank you very much for the interview and thank you for uh, all your uh, activities for the, the CEOs, of course, a wonderful initiative. And I hope that students at other universities will feel inspired to do the same thing. Hopefully. So uh, nice to see you again today and um, that will be all.